talk like that I'm a podcaster because I used to be a podcaster. I'm no longer, or at least not currently a podcaster. It's okay. It's it's okay. Live on podcast, um, so for the last talk of today, we're going to talk about building a modern subscription experience on Android. I mean iOS. <laughs> <laughs> you. Who got scared? <laughs> um, we could have also called it amazing annual recurring revenue on iOS, <laughs> which I think we have, but you know, wanted to be a little more calm. Could have gone for superb subscriptions on iOS. I didn't make the cut. Or maybe interesting in-app purchases, but I'm not sure if they're that interesting. Um, so why don't we just go with that first one? Let's build a modern subscription experience on iOS. As I said, last talk of the day, um, and I think it was already mentioned this morning, but uh, I want to ask you, are there any people here that are attending a conference for their first time? Wow, that's quite a few. Um, so what I would go, what I want to encourage you to do, and, and I think this was mentioned this morning, is go and chat to your favorite speakers from today, because uh, they would love to chat. It's not, you know, oh, you know, we're tired, we don't want to talk to you. We would love to. So especially, we're going to have some time, we're going to have some nice times with barbecue. Go and talk to the speakers and uh, tell them what you thought. So who am I? Um, I am Boss Thomas on Twitter. You've technically already seen that like 10 times in all the slides so far, but you know, now you definitely know. Um, and a few years ago, I really started my um, career uh, at a company called Xing. And as we are in Cologne in Germany, there might be some people that know this company. It's a professional social network and it's uh, based, well, the headquarters are in, in Hamburg. So I used to live in Hamburg and work there for quite a while. Um, during that time as well, I did a bunch of open source work. So these are not companies, but it's open source work. I uh, worked on Moya, which was an uh, abstraction for networking, uh, as well as GitHawk, which is what uh, started the GitHub app in open source, and now it's actually part of GitHub itself, which is really cool. Um, long story short, I ended up at Apple, <coughs> like to do, um, and I worked on macOS VoiceOver, um, which was very cool, and I don't regret that experience, but since then, I ended up uh, at WeTransfer, and I've been working there since uh, last November. So that's me. Um, why am I talking about this topic? Uh, well, really because this is what I've been working on at WeTransfer. Um, and so the WeTransfer app, uh, for those of you that don't know it, by the way, is an app where you can transfer large files. Um, and it's been around for a while, as in the service has been around for a while. But the iOS app actually only launched last October, just a month before I joined. And so we launched WeTransfer on iOS. We didn't really market it, right? Because it was the first release and we wanted to take things a little slow. Um, but then in terms of installs, we saw the lines go up and up and up. And you would say, wow, this is a good thing, right? This is a really good thing. Or is it? Um, because then some people are like, huh, maybe we're actually doing a bit too well. And then I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about users actually finding our app, either through the App Store or through our website and opening a link on iOS. And so then some people higher up were like, we want to make some money now. <laughs> because we have a lot of users and we should, you know, work with that, which is pretty fair. Um, but I think we kind of underestimated how many people were going to download and like, then it was like, oh, you know, we really should do this now. Um, so the good thing was we, uh, we had some designs. And so if you have your designs ready as developers, you just got cracking, right? Uh, no. Because 
there's this very important uh, topic that I care a lot about that you also want to take into account, and that would be accessibility. Because it wouldn't exactly be a modern experience if it weren't accessible, right? Um, so I also, also, I told the organizers of this conference that I was going to talk either about subscriptions or accessibility, and so kind of ended doing do both. So hopefully that's fine. Otherwise, I'm not sure what's going to happen. But. And so the next step we took um, was, and yeah, this is Twitter. Um, if you're still awake, good, good that you noticed it. Um, we started with our design, and then we did a second iteration, basically, of what do we need in terms of accessibility. And I'm showing this Twitter example because, you know, Twitter, what? Um, we're still learning, we're still getting up to speed with accessibility at the company, and so we didn't really do things this way, which I think is really cool, but we kind of just did it on the fly and made a Jira ticket and that was kind of it. Um, but hopefully in the future we can, like, we can do better there and like, have that as part of our process. Next up. So when we talk about accessibility, there is more than just assistive technologies, and we'll get to that. Um, and so this morning there was a, you know, a talk about animations, and there was a question about what else can we do, or what can we do to make animations visible to voiceover. Um, you can't really, because, you know, um, but there are other things you can do, and it's really important that there are multiple la layers of accessibility, uh, and so haptics uh, are a great way to also, uh, separate from, you know, another way of, of you know, showing something like uh, an animation to give the user an understanding of what's going on. So we looked at haptics. Um, Obviously, quote unquote, we also looked at voiceover, which really is the base of accessibility and that everything is built on top of. Um, two of those things that are built on top of voiceover are voice control and full keyboard access. And we'll see all of these come by uh, going forward. And so, as I already said, there's multiple layers of accessibility, there's assistive technology, and there's a lot more. Uh, think about dark mode, think about motion that we've talked about a lot, and a lot more as well. And actually, when I joined the team and when the app launched in October, there was no dark mode. And I was like, why is that not there? And obviously, it's, you know, it's easier said than done, um, but luckily we have dark mode now. But actually, when we started with subscriptions, we didn't have dark mode yet, so kind of have to wedge that into the project as well. All right. Let's get cracking. We're ready to go now. So, one thing that is really cool that I think was announced uh, at WWC 2020 is a local configuration for your subscriptions. And so, what does that mean? Uh, it means that right in Xcode, you can configure your would be in app purchases. Um, so, as you can see here on the left as well, we have set up an auto-renewable subscription, which is what we wanted to add. Uh, there's this transfer plans, and we'll get to that. And then there's the separate options to subscribe to. And what's really cool is that you can set this up in the scheme editor of your project. And you can test subscriptions already. No need for any setup on App Store Connect. No need for any server. You can test from here. There's actually a handy tool in Xcode as well, where you can have an overview of all your transactions, do refunds, and do all of that kind of testing. So definitely recommend to check that out if you have been working with subscriptions and haven't touched this yet, or if you have yet to work with subscriptions. So that's kind of where we started, you know, trying out, doing a little bit of testing, and seeing where, where we could get. And in the meantime, some more like things were rolling in. Oh, we need to take care of this, we need to take care of that, uh, et cetera. So we started slowly. And one thing we did uh, was to use feature flags because you know it was gonna be a lot to build. I was not 
really looking forward to having a feature bunch that would grow and grow and grow and be around for, well, whoever knows how long. Um, so we introduced some feature flags to be able to continuously work on this, merge it into uh, our develop branch uh, without having to ship it immediately. So, so far, so good. Everything's going to be fine, right? We'll, we'll, we'll get back to this later. Maybe not everything was fine, but anyhow. So, we're making some progress. Um, we actually already had this screen in the app, um, but without the option of like, this is your current plan or you know, pricing, etc. cetera. Um, so this was a great place where we could start with our subscriptions. And with this local configuration, we could start buying our subscription. So here, premium yearly, um, we got this off the ground pretty quickly and we were, we were excited. Um, same thing for monthly, we could uh, do that here at the top. You can also see where we could switch from monthly to yearly with our nice C17%, um, which was actually in another app of retransfer. The 17% was hard coded. I didn't really want to do that again because technically it's probably true, but we have all these different, you know, um, currencies and we made sure to, to improve that. Anyway, there's one slide of code uh, in this presentation and this one's it. I hope, hope it's readable with the, with the light coming from there. But anyway, this is really cool. Really the main function that drives our subscriptions is purchasing a product, which makes sense. But for all of you that have worked with StoreKit, it's not that straightforward and not that simple. Um, but you might have noticed, line number one, check revenue cap configuration. So a little bit on revenue cap later. Um, we try and purchase our product, we get some information back or an error, we return that information and we deal with it on our side. That's really all that we needed to do, including some backend work, including some setup on the server, but Generally, on iOS, that's it. Really, that's it. Thanks, Revenue Cap. Um, but then, we crashed. We went live with our first version and everything started crashing. And I might be thinking I'm putting Revenue Cap in a bad light. I swear, it was not Revenue Cap. It was, it was actually Apple. Who would have thought? Has anyone ever told you to be careful with force and rapid? <laughs> yeah, nobody told me. So we crashed. Um, again, you know, it was kind of Apple school, but anyway. So we have this comment and it said, when we are here, we should always be able to find a package. And a package here uh, is this like identifier for, you know, transfer monthly. Um, if not, that's a programmer error because you know you made a typo and you'll break it. Should work, right? Double checked it; it all worked locally, and you know we set it up in App Store Connect. We submitted it to Apple because that's what you have to do with subscriptions. It was approved, and then we launched our app, and it crashed. So it can also be an Apple issue. So please do not crash if this is the case because this product identifier somewhere on the server was not known yet. Anyway, I want to give the first of a, of a few demos. And going back to the top of a topic of accessibility, um, one of the favorite things that I learned this year or was told is one great way to share knowledge about accessibility and to get this topic known to people is to give all your demos using an assistive technology. So that's what we're going to do. And what we're going to look at is the plans and pricing page that you already kind of saw uh, with the example where we were trying to purchase a package. And let's see what that's like. We transfer, close, button, plans and pricing, heading, selected, monthly, button, Yearly button. Save 
Pro heading. Send really big files regularly. Send and receive up to 200 GB. One terabyte transfer storage. $11.99 per month. Upgrade button. Headings. Premium heading. Free heading. Send files once in a while. Send up to 2 GB. Transfers expire after 7 days. Zero dollars no money. No problem. Current plan <laughs> dimmed button. Free premium heading pro heading. Upgrade button. Test subscribe but test flight heading. Subscribe button. Confirm with side button. Sign in button. Sign in dimmed. Pro test flight heading. Alert, you're all set. Your purchase was successful. OK, button. You're all set. Your app store subscription has been changed. Got it, button. Account, heading. Bass, bassitduck.com. Pro, button. And as you can see, after a while, navigating through that screen and purchasing a product, we are now pro. Um, for those of you that paid attention, uh, there was a little bit of awkwardness around this save 17% because it wasn't really attached to this segmented control. That's what you get when you build custom UI. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, and then we use the headings uh, with a rotor that we'll uh, maybe look at again as well. And so we could navigate the screen a bit quicker. Um, okay, so that was easy mode because this is not how your power users are using VoiceOver. Let's take another look at the same demo from the perspective of a VoiceOver user. VoiceOver on. We transfer containers. Speaking rate 56, 6, 70, 75, 7, 80, 7, 85, 7. Because if you're you know, using a screen reader, you might not need to see anything. You might not even be able to see anything, so why waste battery? And there's a lot of content to go through. We can visually scan what's on the screen, but they can't. So screen, uh, or, uh, speaking rate is set to like 200%, if not higher. It was basically trying to do the same thing as the previous um, demo those, so hopefully you got a little bit of that. And maybe now you want to try out a little bit of voiceover, and maybe some Windows will crank up that speed. Anyway, so we launched, we fixed our crash, and I want to show some nice graphs that are really cool to see. Um, so looking at active subscribers, we saw our line go up pretty nicely, um, pretty steadily as well. And looking at our active subscriptions, uh, active subscriptions per country as well, did pretty well. And there was one big winner. Uh, maybe you can guess what that is. It's the U.S. Um, so so far so good. And then the ARR that I was talking about mostly sounds like a pirate. Uh, what means the annual recurring revenue, or actually. The 
projected annual recurring uh, revenue because we haven't been live for a year yet. Um, but also that going up pretty nicely. And so again, everything's going to be fine, right? We're doing well. We're selling lots of subscriptions. Um, ha, if only. So we have to do a little bit of reverse uh, reversing and go back in time a little bit. Because um, I was talking about the feature switch. And we did a gradual rollout because we wanted to assess if things worked well. And, you know, so actually what we did is we only made the app subscriptions available in Canada. Uh, that's green. And then later we added the UK as well. That's blue. Sounds good, right? I mean, seems to be working pretty well and everything was going fine. Until there was a random new update and Apple was telling us, actually, you have a product that you sell everywhere in the world, but not on the App Store. Can you please make it available outside of the UK and Canada? For us, that wasn't really a bug. That was a feature. We wanted to assess this, you know. Um, but hey, Apple is blocking us, so YOLO. <laughs> Might have to explain this to the older people in the audience. It's kind of like carpe diem. <laughs> Might have to explain that to the younger people in the audience, but what I meant to say is we launched, but before we launched, we were doing this, you know, it's like, oh, we're doing this gradual rollout, everything's fine, at some point we'll roll out globally, and then, woof, we have to roll out globally, so it wasn't actually lawyers or whatever, but some, you know, higher ranking people in the company were like, whoa, let's calm down, we have to check, you know, check things and sign off on this. So, that's a number crunching. We waited patiently for a week, or maybe two, and we got green light. And so we uh, released in the whole world. This time everything went fine actually, which is good. Um, but from here, there was a bunch more to do. So one of them is paywalls, right? As we've seen, we only really launched this like tab in the app that had just all the overview of our subscriptions. But you know, if we want to go back to some thoughts on modern subscription experiences, this is probably not the best way to get people to subscribe because it's not while they're uploading a file or whatever. It's really just like, oh, I'm uploading a file. Oh, I'm adding too much data. I guess I'll go back to that tab, buy Pro, and then go back and upload things. That's terrible. Or at least can be improved. Um, and we actually like, to sh you know, I mean, maybe. It's Technically true, paywalls are like inherently contextual, uh, but we're adding these contextual paywalls. So it's time for another demo. And so you know what time it is as well. We're going to do a demo with another assistive technology. Um, this time it's the uh, honor of voice control. Let's have a listen. So I'm sorry about the sound being very quiet. Hopefully you could, you know, at least follow what, what was happening. It was basically telling the screen, like, tap this button, tap the next button. Um, 
And one thing that was interesting is I said, go back, and it went back. It missed the screen. Um, and that's an interesting one, because this is where you know, this thing comes into play where I said, voiceover is really the base of accessibility, and the other things are built on top of it. So in voiceover, you can use the two-finger Z gesture, or as I like to call it, the Zorro gesture, to go back the screen. And that uses the accessibility uh, perform escape API. That then also works in voice control, saying go back, which is really neat. All right. So we added paywalls for changing the expiration date, uh, for adding password protection, as we just saw, and for going over transfer limit. So we tied that all together, did all the paywalls, um, but there was actually one missing, or another one we wanted to do, um, which was the pre-login paywall. And you might be like, what is that? And when I heard about it first, I was also like, what is that? What are we doing? Um, we're asking the user to subscribe before they even log in. That sounds odd, right? And well, I thought the same, um, but it was recommended by Apple. So they said it works really well. And so we sat up and looked into it and ended up, ended up building it as well. But a note on customer satisfaction because you want happy customers. And you want to be careful with quote unquote tricking users to buy subscriptions. Because that's a little bit what it feels like right now, where you know we open the app and we start and it's like in your face, like, oh you can subscribe. You can also like log in or sign up, but you can also subscribe, big button. Um, so be careful with these screens. Um, in the end, you don't want users to end up buying it and then regretting it because they didn't understand something. You want to show them the benefit of it. Time for another demo. And as you guessed, another assistive technology. Um, so this time, it starts from a black. Um, and we're going to take a look at the pre-login paywall using full keyboard access. So that's navigating the app only by keyboard. So I want to give you all an update on our pre-login paywall that we've been working on for iOS. So here we see that we've opened the paywall and uh, we're using full keyboard access here. And we're going to you know, buy a subscription uh, and we're going to log in. And this is before a user has signed up or logged in. Uh, so bought the subscription. So now we're going to link it to the user by creating a new account. And then for that, we're going to make it snazzy, new account uh, to link the subscription to. Um, and then the magic will happen where we're going to connect that account to the subscription that was just bought. So to verify your email, and now we can see when we navigate to the account that, ta da! The user is pro, and uh, we can also verify a plans page where we see the current time is monthly pro. And so, if you paid attention, uh, you can again see those layers of accessibility. So we have voiceover, we have voice control using some more uh, of that with go back, um, and we also added something that is called user input labels. Right. So many of you might. Have heard about accessibility labels for voiceover. The user input labels can differ from the accessibility label and are used for user input, whether that is voice or through a keyboard. And so here, we could navigate the app, not just by tabbing through all the items, but actually just searching for the account menu and the tab. And what's cool is you can add multiple labels, right? Because you might have a settings icon that is like a cog. And you know, maybe most users are going to search for settings, and if you set your accessibility label to settings, that will be fine. But if they're going to search for cog or gear, you can then fix that with user input labels and add those. And you can you can choose as a user. Everything will find the same button. 
So we're kind of at the end here where you know we shipped subscriptions, we added paywalls, we added the pre-login, and we rolled out globally, and so we shipped everything. Before we wrap up the presentation though, um, you might be wondering, what is this about? And I don't know if anybody knows what this is. Um, it's a watch, it's a movement of a watch. Uh, it's a movement of a German watch. Um, and so we did well, we're taking like German clockwork. Um, secondly, there's this quote, there's something one should, one should expect, not only of a watch, but also of oneself, to never stand still. Which maybe is a little bit too deep of a quote for this presentation. Uh, and maybe I'm not really doing it justice with what I'm going to show you next. Um, because we shift, but there's more to be done, or more that we can do. There's more experiments that we can do. Um, and experiments kind of translate to optimization, right? We want to get the value if we transfer it to people's hands, so we want people to subscribe, so our R goes up. Um, there's a small asterisk though, as already mentioned, you still want to keep in mind that you want happy customers rather than short-term cash, with the bracket here indeed meaning you know, better than uh, not happy customers lead to short-term cash, because it doesn't. So, some optimizations to consider, and this is kind of the state we're in, we're considering uh, things, uh, we, we're you know, looking into doing these optimizations, doing these experiments. Um, we might want to default to monthly, so if you've been paying attention as well in our paywall, but we only show pro, and we default to a yearly subscription, which is good for us because it's more money. But the user might not, you know, prefer that. So we can change the default to monthly and see what kind of effect that has. We might default to yearly because in the plans tab we default to monthly uh, at the moment. So also this is something we can experiment with. We can put more emphasis on pro, which is kind of what we're already doing, because the payrolls focus on that, and also the plans that does that. Um, and this then, you know, at WeTransfer, we have pro and premium, but this might differ for, for your company. Um, and we can do the same with focusing more on premium. All things that we can test. Uh, there's also like button colors, which I find a little tricky to get into, because it, eh, you know, and there's, there's more to be done or more that we can do. And there you really want to verify, 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 because things can actually go wrong, right? Like, we actually just chipped something and we realized, oh, this led to a big drop in people actually like purchasing subscriptions. So we, we verified, we were able to, you know, get awareness of it and we will it back. And with all of that, I hope you will be able to or you've learned a bit about building a modern uh, subscription experience on iOS and will be able to rake in some cash. Thank you very much. Thank you, Buzz. Do we have any questions? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I, I was the author of the question about the animations and voiceover, and that's right. I like to use, for example, a haptic engine or some voices, like um, you have the alert, and the alert has some voice to inform that something is happened, and it's pretty good to make the animations accessible too. I have one question. Uh, when you implemented the, uh, the accessibility ins inside your app, did you thought about other languages than English only? Because English language is pretty simple in many cases. In Polish language, for example, we have different words for the same in any other inclination. And then we should think about it to pro pronounce something in proper way. How it was about your project, how it works. Yeah, so we 
do, I don't know when they ship, but we do support 11 languages. Uh, I'm not sure if Polish is one of them. Um, but I we definitely, not. huh? I think not, but it's not a problem. I, I don't think it is, no, but so uh, we've added that internationalization. But you're right, right? Intonation is really interesting, especially when it comes to something like voiceover. And so I think that's something that we're gonna have to explore once we add uh, these kind of languages and also talk to users and get that kind of feedback. Um, luckily, the APIs allow for it, right? So you can set the pronunciation for words, but that's definitely something we're gonna have to uh, see as a big challenge and, and deal with when we, uh, when we do. Thank you very much for this topic. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious, you showed for the iOS implementation it was very much like a one-line code for revenue cats. On um, the back end, how much work was it? Because our back end developers are very scared about store kits and the amount of hassle it is to manage all the subscription stuff. Is it true today? Or? Um, so I think in the back end, it doesn't really <coughs> change much if you're using revenue cat or not. Um, so what you get from Apple is a like a, a URL basically that gives you callbacks for subscriptions, right? So user cancel or a subscription has ended, etc. And then, so one of the things as well in our subscription setup, we link the Apple subscription to one of our we transfer users, right? Because we also want the subscription to work on the web and on Android and any places the user might use our product. Um, and so that linking, that happens in the back end. <coughs> that was some back end work that we needed to do. Uh, and then other than that, the back end handles all of these callbacks from the server uh, that say, hey, okay, it's canceled or it's been you know, extended or it's changed from pro to premium, et cetera, um, which is quite a bit of work. Um, but at the same time, I think it's quite a documented, stable JSON API that you, you will be able to work with. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I think there are certain slides you promised to come back to Revenue Cat because I have no idea what it is. Ah, yeah, so Revenue Cat uh, is a. <laughs> uh, Revenue Cat is a. What is, it, what is it called these days? Like software as a service provider. Uh, and so they have an SDK that basically wraps StoreKit and makes it a lot easier to deal with, as we saw. We really have like one major like like function and that's it to purchase products and to handle all the errors and handle all the states. Um, and then what they do as well, all the charts you saw is revenue cat. So they provide a very good overview of everything that's going on with subscriptions. Uh, and so therefore, you know, we chose to go with revenue cat and make things easier and make things even as well because we're gonna add subscriptions to Android. Um, Okay, the web, web subscriptions, those work differently, but so for, for all of mobile, we can use like one SDK. Uh, so that's, that's our new account. But yeah, go check them out. Do you have any data on how many users are using our app on accessibility? Um, we don't. Um, nor do we really want to, or at least nor do I really want to. Um, because I don't think it's about how many users, right? We can say, and it's also it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because if you say, oh, we have a thousand voiceover users, right? Like, voiceover users are going to download your app, not be able to work with it if it's not accessible, which is going to go away. So, measuring those numbers is never really going to get you the actual numbers. And so, there's great numbers from Apple and other sources that give an indication of how many. Uh, users, you know, have to deal with a disability, not specifically like require the use of voiceover. Um, but I think it's more important to look at your neighbor, your mother, you know, your colleague that just might not be able to do things in a normal way and might rely on these products and might rely on these products being accessible. And then it's about black and white, not being able to use your app versus being able to use your app rather than, oh, we can impact a thousand users. Yeah, uh, well, I was asking because I, I was chatting to a, a blind guy that I know quite recently, and he was saying that they're actually people are actually very loyal. You know, that if if word gets around within the community that your your app does accessibility and you're the first, people are very unlikely to change. 
because there's a big barrier for them to change. So it's actually sort of unknown benefits, really, that it, it works well for people. Absolutely, yeah, no, totally. Like these users, again, right? It's like difference between not at all and like being able to use your product, right? Imagine not being able to use Spotify or not being able to use Mail, right? Like that's, that's terrible. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of, you know, win or, or like benefit to like actually supporting these kind of users. And I would argue as well, thinking about accessibility in your process as well, right? It will lead to a better app because you will have another like, um, like iteration, thinking about your product, thinking about how it's structured, and you will make it better for everyone. Hi, thanks for the nice presentation. I have two questions. I think uh, some of it might tie into the previous question, but I want to um, want to hear your thoughts from a developer perspective on how do you know if you are getting accessibility right? That's number one. And number do you, two. Do you mind if I answer that? And then yes. you have, okay. So I think one thing that's really important there is talk to your users, right? Go in to go to these loyal users. Go to a website uh, specifically for Apple platforms then, uh, like AppleViz.com or so AppleVIS.com. Uh, that's a community of you know people that use VoiceOver uh, mainly. And go and talk to them and say, hey, we've been trying to improve things. Uh, we would love your feedback. That will give you that kind of indication of how well you've done, right? Because those are these power users that just will turn off and will not see your screen and will have to rely on what you've done. Um, but I think a lot of it is also like education, right? Being able to use an assistive technology as a developer, as a you know, and having that kind of understanding of like, okay, what can we do in the first place? Because you can technically make it worse, you know, if you say, oh, we're not going to add a label called settings, but we're going to add a label called water to our settings app icon. Like, yeah, okay, then you're making it worse, but you're not likely to make it worse. So, like, make an effort, go and reach out to users and get their feedback. And uh, my second question is, uh, when it comes to visual representations of user interface buttons, uh, things like this, you have the liberty to optimize um, for for better conversion, let's say, for a lot of product decisions. Um, how do you do that with accessibility? Because from what I saw in your demos, it is um, there's, there's there's a lack of emphasis between one thing and the other. Is that something that's possible? Is that something that you all have explored or want to explore? That's some good feedback, because I think we can do a lot better. Um, and that starts with this like custom uh, UI that I mentioned, right? Where we say yearly button, and then like you have to like swipe right, and then it's like save seventeen percent. Like that should really be like one label where it says yearly save seventeen percent button. Um, because again, we don't we, we want to treat all of these users equally. Um, so what we can visually see, we want them to experience through voiceover or whatever assistive technology. Uh, so I think we can definitely do better there. And I think the same can be said for the paywall, where we default to yearly, but that's like on the uh, like trailing edge of the screen. And so really what we want to do is maybe have a custom like sort order there, where we go there first and then go to monthly. But we don't do that now, so I should probably create a Jira ticket. <laughs> Thank you. Another question, because it's my favorite topic last night, um, uh, accessibility. About the user experience and the user interface, did you manage to develop how the accessibility should be implemented on the layer before the implementation of the project, or you did it in the team, uh, in iOS team? I mean, where was the, the this layer of preparing accessibility for the people to make it you know, consistent in the app, similar to your behaviors? some best practices for all the teams because I'm guessing that with time you are working with a bigger group of the people. Yeah, so this is definitely still a learning process. Uh, you know, like the example with Twitter, like we're not doing that yet. We're, we're, you know, we haven't integrated accessibility into our process that much yet. Um, so that's definitely something we, we can do better. 
Um, but I went into the team and specifically, you know, when I was working on a new project subscription, then I was like, I will, I will make it accessible, right? I will just make it accessible. I will do what I can with my knowledge. And so I said, I'll just take it into account for any ticket that we do. And, you know, that's, that's, that was a start, but I think there's more to be done to like look at it more holistically from the whole team and like at the whole app level of like, what is our like accessibility experience like? So those are those basic practices like testing the code and other things that we should do. Sometimes we do not have a time for it, but it's necessary. And there was a question about the how many. It doesn't matter. It matters that one person will use it and that's enough for, for this time that we'll spend to implement accessibility. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have to start somewhere. Hi. Um, so I totally agree with everything that's been said about accessibility. I believe in it completely, but I'm, just, I'm already thinking now that if I suggest this to my company, there will be pushback against it because I don't think they strongly believe in this. So do you have any advice on how you would make this part of the culture of the product company? Like, how do you get them on board with this on the roadmap to make the app accessible? Because no one's asking for a field site, sort of thing. Yeah, so it, it, it's really, really tough. Uh, I've been trying this for the better part of like five, six years now, and really only now getting somewhere, probably partially also because the company actually wanted to. Um, I think on the one hand it's about just doing it, right? Like there's nobody that's going to stop you from saying, hey, I've made this accessible, and like look at my demo, I'm going to use voiceover, right? If they then say, oh, you shouldn't be, you know, spending time on that, yeah, you know, then it becomes really difficult. Um, but I think also going back to like having this kind of experience and having this education on accessibility is really important because by no means do I want to say that accessibility is easy, but if you have more knowledge about it and you take it into account, you know, especially again like we saw with the Twitter example from your design, making something accessible to a large extent does not take that much time, right? So if you have the knowledge in the team or if you have the knowledge personally, you can start with things. That should hopefully not be like, you know, too big of a concern. But obviously that's easier said than done and, and definitely said from like, yeah. you know, a privileged position. Um, how much of accessibility in first design and how much and vice versa because do you have to think about accessibility first before you go into the design phase, or can you just tackle accessibility after the design? How much do this to play? Um, it's a good question. So now at this point, for like for for this project, I really just did it myself. Like after the designs were done, so I basically took the designs and said like, okay, where do we need labels? What kind of user input labels do we do we need? Um, and hadn't really thought about it, like the whole experience of like what can we improve, or like going back to the drawing table of design and saying like, okay, we've noticed that this might not be a great assistive like uh, experience with assistive technologies. Maybe we can also improve it for for all users. Um, I think that's something that hopefully will come at some point. Thank you. Do we have some more questions? <laughs> So the question is how many people implement voiceover in their apps? I do not know. Oh, okay, raise your hand if you're doing accessibility. Wow. Very good. I'm very proud of all of you. All of you, but especially those. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, boss.